federal judge rules gun prohibitions for drug users unconstitutional. Plus, a conversation with Professor James Densley of The Violence Project on trends in and potential solutions to mass shootings. That and more on this episode of The Weekly Reload Podcast. No, the devil's got no All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gutowski. I'm also the founder of TheReload.com, where you can head over and check out our free weekly newsletter if you want to keep up to date with what's happening with guns in America all throughout the country every week for free. Uh, Or you can sign up for a membership. You can purchase a membership from us and get exclusive access to hundreds of pieces of uh, news and analysis that you will not find anywhere else. Uh, this week on the show, we are discussing uh, mass shootings. We're, we're talking about the trends in mass shootings over the last really 50, 60 years, I guess, and uh, some of the potential solutions. And to do that, we have a special guest with us, uh, Professor James Densley. Uh, welcome to the show, Professor. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show. Now, you are with The Violence Project. Uh, can you tell people a little bit more about that project and yourself? Sure, yeah. I'm a professor of criminology and criminal justice at Metro State University, which is based in St. Paul, Minnesota. You might tell from the accent, I'm not originally from there. I'm originally from the UK. Um, (laughs) But um, And then the Violence Project is a nonprofit research center. We're a nonpartisan uh, research center that is focused mostly on mass shootings, but on sort of gun violence in general. Um, It was It was born out of a research project that we did initially funded by the National Institute of Justice, which is the research arm of the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. And um, we studied the life histories of mass shooters going back to uh, 1966. And we've built a database of mass shooters. It's available on the website. You can freely download it and interact with it, uh, which is theviolenceproject.org. And we also interviewed uh, perpetrators of mass shooters uh, we uh, we interviewed people who knew them. We interviewed survivors of the shootings. We interviewed family members who lost loved ones in mass shootings. We interviewed first responders as well. And all that's chronicled in the book, also titled The Violence Project. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I actually uh, listened to the book uh, yesterday for the first time. I've been well aware of the project for a long time and, and used it as a resource in, in my reporting as well. Um, I think it's one of the most comprehensive looks at this topic that exists out there. I think it's one of the only ones that uh, where researchers have gone out and done the legwork that you guys have done. And so I think that makes it very valuable. And I think that you've touched on a lot of key insights that uh, are also shared by a number of other researchers in this area. Uh, Professor James Allen Fox would be an example of one from um, Northeastern who does the database that Associated Press and USA Today use. Um, it's very similar to the research that you've done. And we've had him on the show as well. People should check out that episode to get some of his his input and uh, his thoughts on the matter. But they're, they're similar in nature to a lot of the ones that you found. And so that uh, that that is in, interesting in and of itself. People who really intently follow these things seem to draw some fairly similar conclusions. Uh, why don't we just start at the beginning here with the definition, because this is a key thing. I'll have a piece actually at the reload on this. Um, and I've talked about this to uh, with CNN colleagues before as well. Um, but methodology, right? It's very important. There are several mass shooting counters out there and they vary wildly. Um, if you look at the bank shooting that took place in Louisville this week, you that depending on the count that you go by, that's either the 146th mass shooting, the 15th, or the fourth. Uh, now you guys would be the four, uh, yeah. and so give us an understanding of why why that is. What what do you guys count as a mass shooting? Yeah, you mentioned James Allen Fox. You know he's a pioneer in the field of this research, and we certainly sort of stand on the shoulders of those types of giants and. He was one of the individuals that was really instrumental in thinking about definitions. Definitions matter in social science, and we we all know that. And when you're focusing on a very specific phenomena, you want to be very careful about how you're defining the parameters around it. So one of the things that, that, that 
what uh, James Fox talks about is that, that death is different. And that although the body count is an arbitrary number, it could be three, it could be four, it could be five. There is something right. qualitatively different about those mass shootings that result in uh, mass killings and mass casualties, uh, maybe versus those that result in multiple people shot and injured, but not necessarily killed. Now, that doesn't diminish the tragedy, though, of those other events. And I think this is the important piece, which is as long as you're very clear about what definition you're using and why you're using it, and that transparency and accountability is there, then everybody knows what everyone's talking about. But unfortunately, what we often see is that people use these definitions interchangeably, maybe to advance some sort of agenda or whatever it is. And that can lead to a lot of confusion in the public because then they're asking themselves, well, is it four, is it 15, or is it hundreds? And, and we don't know. Right. I think the other piece is this. In our research, we're focusing on a very specific phenomena, which is this sort of indiscriminate public mass killing where mm -hmm. somebody goes into a church, a bank, a school and perpetrates what many of us think of as a mass shooting. That is qualitatively different from, for instance, a gang related shooting or from domestic violence where somebody kills their family. And again, none of that diminishes the tragedy of those other things. They also need research and focus and attention and solutions, but they need different solutions. They need a different focus. There's a rich literature on gangs and gang intervention. I've written a lot of it, actually. I do a lot of research in the area of gangs. Um, there's a rich literature in the area of domestic violence and domestic homicide. And what we're trying to do is contribute to that literature around these public mass shootings, which require a different sort of understanding from those other forms of gun violence. Yeah, I, and I think you hit on the perfect explanation of why I I prefer uh, your definition. Now, there, so it's four or more people killed in a public mass shooting, and you're, you exclude things like robberies or, or gang-related incidents is, is the basic uh, definition that you guys use. That's I think correct. Was, the Congressional Research Service was the one that um, you know, detailed it, but uh, but that's what you guys use. There's there's uh, James Allen Fox's definition includes um, four more killed, but but they also include uh, this is the 15 um, domestic, domestic homicides that that happen inside of someone's house, right. um, that which happen to be the most common form of uh, when someone kills four or more people, unfortunately. But but like you said, very different sort of issue um, with different solutions, not any less important, but um, but different. And, and then, of course, you have the gun violence archive count, which is probably the most famous one, I guess, or the one that's most often repeated uh, by media outlets, which counts four or more injured in, in any sort of shooting, uh, regardless of uh, motivations or circumstance. And so the, that one is obviously the broadest. And, uh, and I think, to me, at least, gets um, has the problem of incorporating a lot of very different kinds of, of attacks, not that it's uh, isn't valuable on its on its own to count these these things to get some sort of guideline um, about how often people multiple people are being um, shot in a in a in an attack. But uh, and of course we interviewed uh, Mark Bryant from the, the Gun Violence Archive a few I believe months back and talked about these issues. So people should check out that podcast if they want and to hear his explanation. And that's important because explanation. None of these numbers is wrong. I think that's the most important thing. None of them is wrong. It's just that they are counting slightly different phenomena. And mm -hmm. there, there is a risk that when people don't understand the definitions that you're using, you conflate the numbers together and that leads to confusion in the public and in the conversations around policy and practice and everything else. So that's really the challenge here. But it's not that any of the numbers are wrong. And it's valuable that we're counting all of them because at the end of the day, anyone who's losing their life to gun violence, and by the way, the ripple effects of those shootings as well, you know, that mm. deserves our attention. It deserves our action. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Uh, the other reason that I find your work to be particularly valuable is because your database also goes back much further than the other ones. Um, so the Gun Violence Archive goes back to 2013, and the uh, USA Today Associated Press database goes back to 2006. And one of the issues with that, um, in my eyes, is that you're missing a period of time when 
uh, violent crime was much higher, which is the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s featured violent crime rates in the United States that were far higher than during the, the last 20 to, uh, to 25 years in this country. And, and so one of the issues to me is that, you know, you look at the gun violence archive number and it's increasing significantly over the last several years uh, since the pandemic began. And I, I think what that's telling you more than that there are more mass shootings uh, of the sort of Columbine, Uvalde, um, you know, Las Vegas style. And it's more telling you that there is just an increase in gun violence generally, um, because the, they're, they're at the highest rate they've ever recorded. But that's, I think, a, a large part because they only go back to 2013. And if I, ma I imagine if they were recording these numbers in 20, in 1993, 1996, they would probably be much higher than even they are right now. That, but that's something we can't know because the database doesn't go back that far. Yeah, that's that's a, there's a possibility that's the case. You're right. Violent crime fell to historic lows from it peaked in the mid 90s and then it fell to historic lows around 2014, 2015. And then it's been edging up ever since. And so what we see in our data is we're just tracking those mass public shootings, smaller numbers. Right. And we see still an increase in those types of events, particularly in the last sort of five to 10 years. Yes. Um, but there were still some years, like 1999, the year of Columbine, for instance, was a year that did have seven mass shootings in our database. And it is one of the uh, the highest numbers that we've recorded. But the record numbers were all you know, 2017, 2018, 2019. 2020 was the exception because of the pandemic. Public spaces yeah. were locked down. Mass shootings in public spaces declined. But then in 2021 and 2022, they increased again. And with four this year in our data so far, you know, we're on track to be sort of matching those types of trends uh, this year as well. So we're seeing that increase over time. But you're absolutely right. It's hard to compare when you don't have the data going back. Uh, and, and it's difficult to do this without the Internet is the truth. Yeah. You know, many of these projects like the Gun Violence Archive are a product of the mass information that we now have. It's much mm -hmm. easier to track these things in real time when you can get Google News alerts and when you can actually you know, click on a, an, on a local news station and get the information as opposed to having to go to the library and dig around in the archives. And so it, this, is, uh, this data collection is, is, a, is born through the modern age in many ways. And that's one of the really cool things about it, that we actually have that information available at our fingertips right now. Yeah, certainly. Uh, but, it, but it is something that uh, where, where I think that's a strength of your particular data. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting to see uh, fairly consistent rates over, you know, decade or so, you know, you, you had the nineties were in the close to the range that we're seeing today. Um, a little bit, you know, on average, a little bit lower, but you did have years where there were six or seven. Um, and, and then for the early 2000s, it was a lower rate, like three to four per year. Uh, and then now we've seen an increase again the last five years or so, as you discussed. And, um, you know, I wonder what the, do you have any insight into the, the, the sort of consistency, even though these are fairly statistically rare events, we seem to be having them at a, at a almost a normal pace um uh, and that seems odd to me well you know we in if you go back to the 70s we'd have about one of these events a year in the 80s mm -hmm. two maybe three in the 90s three early 2000s three to four and now we have about six or seven of these events a year so we are seeing that increase and even when you control for population size the, the increase is still present so the question often mm -hmm. is asked like so what's changed what what's different yeah. In, in our society today versus you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And I think there's a lot of contributing factors. And we outline these in the book because I think, as you mentioned at the front end of this, we are trying to embrace the complexity of this problem. And for too long, we've, we've all been siloed in our, in our perspectives around it's one or the other issue. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's not an either or proposition. It's that all these things are happening simultaneously. And you've got to embrace, you know, the, the web of complexity if you're going to come to complex solutions to complex problems. And mass shootings are one of them. So, for example, 
you cannot talk about the rise of mass shootings without recognizing that the United States, compared to other nations, does not have the same social safety net as those other nations. So we have challenges in how we address uh, mental health, physical health, affordability and access and everything else that can be contributing factors to when somebody's in a crisis, because that's the key thing here. Anyone who perpetrates a mass shooting is in a personal crisis. You don't perpetrate a shooting if you intend to survive, because a mass shooting is a final act. It's it's. It, so you have to be at a point where you, you no longer care if you live or die to perpetrate. Did one. you find that was always the case in, in every incident that you guys studied? It seems to be a very common factor, actually, uh -huh. which is to say that there was a perspective, I think, that people would just snap one day and perpetrate this type of a crime. And that led to the going postal phenomenal that pe people would talk about back in the 90s when there was a spate of shootings uh -huh. in post offices. But yeah. the truth of the matter is, is that always a sort of slow build, this type of a violence. And there's usually warning signs on the pathway to it. And it's rooted in individual despair that you get to a point where you feel like the only solution to your problem is to perpetrate a mass shooting. And so here's what's different. In today's society, we have models for this type of behavior. So mass shootings have effectively become normalized, that people can now research, what did other people who felt like me do to solve their problems? Mm. And what they did is they perpetrated a mass shooting. And so if they did it, I might be able to do it too. And I think that is something that is, is, is born of the internet, 24 hour news media, social media, the general kind of climate around information is the dark side of that, which is there are now models for this type of behavior. There are places where you can be radicalized into this type of violence, and that's new. Um, and then, and then what, one last piece on this as well, though, is, of course, there are more firearms available. In some states, they are easily accessible. And it's a mathematical piece to this, right? You look at regular gun ownership levels, they might have even gone down from high points 50, 60, 70 years ago, right? And we know that the vast majority of people who own firearms own many firearms. So I think there was some estimates that half of all civilian owned firearms are, are, are owned by only, you know, five or 10% of the population. So it's not necessarily that everybody is armed and that is what's contributing to mass shootings. But when you've got more guns in circulation, there are just simply more opportunities for those guns to fall into the hands of people that shouldn't have them. So whether it's through theft or whether it's through uh, a purchase that's not been put through a background check or so on and so forth, people get access to firearms that can be used in violent crime. And so it's not necessarily this direct correlation between rising firearm sales and gun violence. It's more complicated than that, but it's layered on everything else. It's layered on social media, media, mental health, everything else is combined. And that's the complexity of this issue. It's, it's not one, it's, it's all. Yeah, and we'll get more to the guns, uh, I think, later, because I had a couple of questions on that um, from the book. But, uh, but I want to focus first on this, uh, you call it social proofing uh, concept, uh, because I, I think that is something that uh, I've heard talked about a lot before. Um, you guys pin uh, Columbine as a particular turning point in this uh, aspect. Social proofing is sort of this idea, uh, some people call it the riot effect, uh, where the more something is done uh, as and begins to be thought of by society as an acceptable response to a certain situation, even if it's not I guess acceptable isn't right, but a common response, even if it's something that society views as horrendous and horrible, like we do with mass shootings. Um, but it's it's sort of the, the, understood that this is something that people going through this type, a certain type of crisis will do or could do. Um, and that makes it more likely to happen because uh, it sort of lowers the bar. And so, and there are specific 
perpetrators who, um, I guess, create the the norms for this 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 act. And Columbine, in, in your estimation, has been uh, one of those key moments where they sort of created the 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 script, I guess, that that a lot of mass shooters now follow. Yeah, I think you've articulated that really well, actually. It, it makes me wish that we almost packaged that for the book, because it, that's exactly the, the argument that we're trying to convey here, which is to say that, you know, if you look at the sociological research on contagion and on how things spread throughout society, uh, Malcolm Gladwell famously wrote about this in a piece for The New Yorker. He talked about threshold models of behavior. And he talked about how our threshold for mass shootings gets lower and lower each time somebody uh, perpetrates a mass shooting because it effectively is, you know, creating a script and it's normalizing that behavior. And in our work, we see Columbine as this sort of blueprint for shootings that follow. And in some ways, that was by design. Because the Columbine shooters left all these legacy tokens for us to pour over. And in some ways at the time in 1999, because Columbine felt so unique, it wasn't, by the way, there had been other school shootings, but there was something about the story of Columbine that captivated the American public unlike anything else. And we put those perpetrators' faces on the front covers of magazines. We talked about them ad nauseum in uh, 24 hour news media, but also the shooters themselves left behind these legacy tapes and, and you know, the basement tapes and these tokens and everything else so that we would continue to talk about them. Well, what's now happened is all that material is out there and people now can go and find it. And in some of the darkest corners of the internet, our research shows People are, they heroize the Columbine shooters. They celebrate them. Um, they, are, they are martyrs for this bigger cause. Um, and people draw inspiration from that. So Columbine is this sort of tipping point for our relationship as a society with mass shootings. And I think that's what's contributed to then the expansion of mass shootings uh, o- over time. There's a scripting in our in our society. And by the way, That script is not just in the darkest corners of the internet. It's also in Mm -hmm. the active shooter drills. We run in schools with our children. And every time we go to the movie theater and the sign flashes up and says, check for the exits in case you might be murdered. You know, we live in a society now where this has become an everyday part of our reality. And that for some people can be inspiration. For most of us, it's horrific and shocking, and we don't want anything to do with it. But if you are in crisis and asking the question, how do I solve the problem? That can be uh, the avenue to go down. Right. Um, and, and you talk about in the book, uh, obviously, the, I think there's, a, there's a, a quote in there that says, the, the worse the shooting, the worse the story. And so you get these people who have in, incredibly traumatic experiences, usually as children, uh, who are disconnected from their community in many cases, and disconnected from any sort of meaningful relationship in their life, alienated from their schoolmates, their teachers, their co-workers. And um, sometimes they will see in themselves these mass shooters. That, that's Those are the people that they see they read their manifesto or what have what have you know what their writings. I know their book talks about you know don't calling these things manifestos is is really it is misleading if anyone's ever read one. They're they're generally rambling um, uh, you know nonsense and they're often coll- they're copy and pasted from other you know writings of other shooters and, and so forth. But but you know somebody sees that the only person they identify with is this person who carried out a mass shooting and that, that can sort of lead, help lead them down that path. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. That, that whole idea of the worst, the worst, the crime, the worst, the story was something that my co-author and colleague, Gillian Peterson is a psychologist. And in a previous life, she worked uh, on death row in death penalty mitigation um, 
And she would interview people who perpetrated some of the most horrific crimes ever. And as we sort of talk about in the book, you know, the expectation in the public is you, you must have met Hannibal Lecter every day. And the truth of the matter was, these were just individuals who were struggling with a whole host of psychological and sociological problems. And they had got to a point where violence felt like their only way out. And we see that pattern replicated in the lives of these mass shooters as well. Terrible stories of, of child abuse, terrible stories of bullying, terrible stories of a uh, of a sort of mental health crisis that's never addressed, searching for answers, feeling lonely, disconnected, isolated, it's all there. And then it's, oh, look, this is how other people like me have solved this problem. They've, they've perpetrated this crime. And if they can get access to a firearm to then perpetrate the crime, that's the accelerant that moves them forward. And so mm. it's this it's this complicated story that at every step along the way, by the way, is an intervention point. And that's the key thing. If we could intervene yes. with the childhood trauma, if we could intervene with the crisis, if we could intervene before they go tumbling down the rabbit hole on social media, and if we can intervene when that person who's at that crisis point is then ready to purchase a gun, any one of those steps, we could have prevented a tragedy. And that's really the key thing that we're trying to uh, promote in this book, which is there are loads of places where we can intervene here. And I think we can all get on the same page for that. Yeah. And that, that's another thing that I appreciate about your research here in the book and the, and the, the website as well. Um, which by the way, you don't, you can go to the website. There's a key findings section that can really give you a good overview of the, the, the important points from your research. So, uh, and really it's very accessible to anyone who uh, is interested in reading it from uh, regular people to school officials or uh, government officials or what have you to get a good idea of uh, some of these solutions. And I want to talk more about the, uh, the specific steps that you propose uh, as, as potential way of preventing these attacks. But for one quick thing before we get to that, um, that I think is uh, an interesting bit in the book um, and that you've alluded to here as well, this sort of memeing of mass shootings, uh, you know, of, of this sort of uh, almost snowballing effect of society comes to view mass shootings not as acceptable things, but as potential options for people in this certain state of mind going through a certain kind of crisis. We have a, uh, a stereotype about what a mass shooter, what a school shooter looks like. Um, like everybody knows. Um, can picture one in their mind and it's a societal idea. Now, you know, I, you guys focus a lot on news media in the, um, in the book and understand, you know, and you have specific ideas for how news media can help prevent these sorts of attacks. But you, uh, you also, I, I also think that there's a sort of goes well beyond news media and even social media. You talk about social media a lot as well. Um, but, I think it goes into entertainment media, into basically just really every aspect of American society. I mean, I think I've seen, I always think about this when there, you know, there was a, there's a new Fox show called accused, right? And the first episode of that is about a school shooting and it plays into a lot of these tropes, but it's, I mean, that I was pretty disappointed by that show generally, because it's a lot of tropey stuff, but, but the first episode is mass shootings and it's, it's all tropes about school shooters the same stuff you've seen a thousand times in different forms of media. Uh, there was a, there was another school shooting movie uh, with Mila Kunis just recently. You know, this is sort of all over society. It's not just in, you know, the, the way media covers these events too. Right. I mean, is that a fair point? Yeah. I mean, our relationship with violence is interesting. You know, I grew up in Europe. I grew up in the United Kingdom and, um, it was always interesting to me that America seemed to have a very complicated relationship with sex on television and in film, but not with violence. And in Europe, it was the other way around. It was, we were quite open to showing sex on camera, but violence, you know, we used to have what was called the watershed, which meant any violent acts couldn't be shown on television after, you know, before 9 p.m. Um, mm -hmm. Living in the United States, you know, I, I can switch on cable 
television in the middle of the afternoon and Goodfellas is playing. Um, and that's great because I love that movie. But you wouldn't see that anywhere else in the world, really. Um, and but at the same time, all the sex scenes will be edited out because we, you know, we don't want to uh, influence our children, which seems odd to me that we we have this uncomfortable relationship when we talk about that aspect, but less so when it comes to violence. So it, it's sort of interesting the cultural norms globally around this that the america america does have a different relationship i think with violence in its media and violence for entertainment value um that's not to say that you know everything is pacifist globally there's plenty of Jeez. british dramas which are full of violence but um but i do think that relationship is, is just different in the united states and but it's always been that way we've we've always right. had westerns and and movies that would uh, maybe glorify uh, those types of actions. But we haven't always had the the school shooter trope or the mass shooter trope. And I think that's... And that's new. Uh, I think that's, that's true. interesting. It's become now part of our, our cultural narrative. And I think that is new. Hmm. And one of the other uh, points here, the, and this I think will lead in well to the sort of solutions uh, conversation, but you talk a little bit about... Uh, well, you brought it up at the beginning of this this podcast, but there was there was a, a spat of uh, postal shootings going postal. There's it's sort of um, weird to me that in uh, one of my uh, near where my mom lives in in Pennsylvania, there's actually a store uh, like a mail store called Going oh, really? Postal. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's like but but even that is kind of an interesting thing because because it's sort of indic indicative of how we don't really see that anymore. That was kind of a trend in yes. the 90s, as you mentioned. And then it doesn't really happen today. Um, and so the same thing with uh, serial killers is another thing that you'd mention and sort of talk about this same sort of contagion effect or um, <clears throat> uh, social proofing effect where serial killers were all the rage, right, in the 80s and 90s. And um, they're not anymore, although I do, uh, you know, they, they have kind of become retro uh, now. Yes, I guess, we, we all love a good which serial is a little killer bit concerning podcast, to me. right? And uh, and yeah, there's there's movies and TV shows about that. That's very Yeah, true. obviously the Dahmer Netflix yep. show was extremely and the Mind popular. Hunter, I watched uh, it. series as well. And, yeah. Right. And so I, I, when I see that, I do think like, oh, gee, I wonder if that, actually we had a serial killer near where I live. Um, recently, it didn't get it, but uh, it noticeably, as you discuss in the book, it did not garner national media coverage in the way that the Dahmer or um, or some of the other spectacular, you know, sensational uh, serial killer stories did uh, in the eighties and nineties. And but uh, but these two trends seem to suggest that this is not something that has to go on forever. And even when these these sort of factors exist like social proofing or contagion effect or the way media, uh, you know, sort of sensationalizes these events, um, <clears throat> they can still be prevented. Um, now you have obviously specific proposals as to um, uh, how that can be addressed. And so uh, you've mentioned a couple of them here, but what, what would you say are the very, just your, your key points as to how society should look at this issue and, uh, try to prevent this this sort of collection of incentives to carry out a mass shooting moving forward. You mentioned this sort of like the cycles that we go through. So there was a massive fear of serial killers in the 80s and early 90s. Child mm -hmm. abductions was a big focus in the mid 90s. School shootings in and around Columbine were a big focus. Post 9-11, it was terrorism, which was a big focus and now it's mass shootings, which are, are sort of, if you look at that trajectory over time, and there's two ways of thinking about it, which is on the one hand, each of those events changed our relationship with society. You know, so people's response to serial killers and child abductors and other things was that we stopped playing outside. We stopped hitchhiking to San Francisco. Um, we changed our routine activities. The big byproduct of 
was if you see something, say something. And we all kind of rallied around this idea that each and every one of us can prevent an act of terrorism because we're all in this together. And I think that's what's maybe unique about mass shootings is that mass shootings aren't unifying us, they're dividing us. Hmm. But one of the things we try and focus on in our book is you can take lessons from the things that we've done over time to address other social problems, including coming together to embrace the complexity of this to actually come towards solutions. So we layer our solutions at three levels. We say there are things you can do at the individual level right here, right now, as a concerned citizen, as a parent to address this problem. And that might be Something as simple as if you have a firearm in the home and a teenager in the home, safely securing that weapon could save lives. Hmm. We also talk about if you have a teenager in your life, mentoring that young person, giving them hope, making them seen, getting them connected to friends and family and community is also going to help prevent a mass shooting. Right, because uh, actually a like, real quick point on that. There is a part in the book where you talk to uh, somebody who had planned to carry out a mass shooting and then was didn't do it. And you'd go through why they didn't do it. And this was a key point, which is this, this sort of relationship that they had. There was somebody, um, a friend's mother had baked them a pie. And that was enough in that moment of crisis that they were going through. Uh, to sort of um, help off ramp them, as you guys talked about off ramping, right? Uh, to to get them away from that that uh, idea of of carrying out a uh, mass killing, and um, you know, it's very similar, I think, in a lot of ways to uh, how how you would prevent suicides, uh, which is another obviously important issue that um, that America struggles with. It has a relatively high rate of suicide for um, you know not. There's obviously other countries that have higher rates, but but it's still an, a significant issue here, and and uh, especially in the gun owning community as well. Um, we've had we've done podcasts with some of the efforts to to um, help alleviate the, the the problems. But but you know the, these solutions seem fairly simple, and that seems to be or fairly similar. <laughs> simple well, is simple, not the right word. No, actually similar. both. I, I and I appreciate well, you saying that because to some degree, providing somebody with a bit of hope, a simple act yeah. of kindness can right. get them through that moment of crisis. And that's why the learning mm -hmm. from suicide prevention is applicable in these cases. Because as I said before, yeah. mass shooting is a final act. It's often a suicidal act. And so what can we apply from suicide prevention to prevent at that individual mm -hmm. level? Um, we also talk about- Yeah, some of, the, some of the tactics are simple. Like the problem is complex, but some exactly. of the ways you can help prevent it are simple, like just- being there for somebody um, uh, doesn't always work, uh, as you described in the book. No. But, but, um, but it's, uh, but it's you know, a, there, there were there were shooters in here who had family members that were you know willing to drive up or fly out to try and help them in the moment of crisis. But it uh, you know it wasn't enough at that point. And there, there's it's not all it's not again there's no one single light switch that you flip. But this is this is the this key problem. thing though for for your listeners, right? Is whenever one of these things occurs, a mass shooting, we all feel hopeless. We feel like mm. nothing's going to happen, nothing's going to change, this is going to keep happening, right? The message here is one of hope, which is to say you have skin in the game with this, right? We don't have to wait for Congress to act. We don't have to wait for some sort of magic wand to be waved. Just by caring for your loved ones and watching out for the warning signs that someone's on that pathway to violence, you can be proactively part of the solution here as an individual, right? So if you feel hopeless in this and you're asking that question of like, what can I do? Just me as a parent, as a teacher, as a concerned American citizen, what can I do? That right there is it. You know, if you've got someone in your life, you know, is struggling, not necessarily that they're going to be the next mass shooter, but just somebody who's struggling, reach out to them, right. uh, take mm -hmm. care of them. And that's and that and that gives you a little bit of ownership. It's the same thing as if you see something, say something. We're all on the same page here. We're all part of the solution. We all have to have eyes open. That's a lot of eyes, right? That's 300 mm -hmm. million eyes looking after one another that can help prevent this problem.
Right. Yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, I think that is, and you'd see that because you, you profile it several times in the book where somebody saying something did prevent, uh, an incident from occurring. Um, it's, it's not a theoretical thing like this, this has been tried in practice and, and, uh, has been successful. And, and, you know, I think it's important to note too, that you mentioned like not, you don't want to help someone because you think they might be a mass shooter. You want to help someone because they need help. Um, and there is no profile. There's no specific set of, uh, boxes that you check that you're going to absolutely identify this person is, is a mass shooter because there's another thing you talk about in the book where, people can go through the same horrendous tra traumatic experiences as a child and grow up and have completely different outcomes from that. And, and so, you know, the, this is another thing that I think the FBI, we also talked to um, uh, the former FBI agent who created the active shooter oh, definition sure. report. And that was one of the key things that they talk about as well. It's, you know, there isn't a profile, there's not a specific, um, there's one, and this is one of the things that makes it difficult to address these issues. Um, you know, uh, you're trying to find the seven or eight people a year who, who are going to carry out an attack like this, or, uh, more if you count people who try to carry out attacks sure. like this and don't, don't get to the, the, the numbers that we, you know, uh, are picking. To and that's count, right but, there. What you just but said still, is it's not a lot of people. No. And that's the key thing, right? Is so, as I mentioned before, we layer those solutions. So that's the individual level. And then we move mm -hmm. up a level and it's institutional, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you then institutionalize? If you see something, say something. Okay. But who do I say something to? Um, yeah. How do I build the systems that I trust the process that when I report somebody, Let's be honest, because I care about them, not because I'm trying to get them in trouble. If I report that person, am I confident that the response is going to be appropriate and it's actually going to help them? So that's where we've got to build those institutions in our workplaces, in our schools, in our communities. That, you know, we talk about things like threat assessment, for instance. Well, what does that really mean? How does that really work in practice? How do you get law enforcement talking to mental health providers, talking to school teachers? How do you get parents that if they're worried about their own child, how do you get that parent to think, I'm going to call 911 on my own son, and I'm going to trust that they are going to get the help that they need? So that's why it comes to building those systems at the institutional level that can take us from that step of, okay, now we've got everybody on the same page that we're all in this together. Now we've got to trust that the actual response is going to be appropriate. And so that's when we, we talk about in the book, how you build those systems at the institutional level to take those solutions to the next level. Hmm. Right. Um, and, and look, I, I think that for the vast majority of what you, what you lay out as the potential solutions, there's, there's, probably going to be almost universal agreement uh, on those things. And, and I do appreciate that. And what that's one of, why I wanted to make the vast majority of this podcast about those topics. But there, of course, are some areas where, uh, as you and as you mentioned before, is mass shooting sort of instead of uniting us, divide us because uh, people see very different solutions to these problems. Um, and and frankly, the parts that we've been talking about here are very very uh, rarely talked about in our public discourse over mass shootings, frankly. Um, uh, what's much more common are discussion over guns. You, now, you guys do have um, uh, proposals in the book that deal with gun policy. You also identify uh, access to firearms as a, uh, one of the issues that um, is causing mass shootings. And that's where I think there's probably going to be a lot of disagreement on on some of the things proposed, uh, I mean, because you, you, you talk uh, a lot about, or not a lot, but you do mention, for instance, um, gun confiscation efforts in New Zealand or uh, Australia and England as positive um, potential solutions to the problem. Now, you know, I, I don't know if you view that as a realistic option here in the United States. It seems it's, like it's it impossible in the United States. I mean, you know, the, the scale is so different, right? Mm -hmm. um, but to deny that it hasn't had an impact mm -hmm. just belies the empirical data. Um, I'm, so I'm not suggesting that that solution is viable in the United States, mm -hmm. but to deny that it didn't have an impact doesn't add up. So for instance, I remember the Dunblane massacre in, in Scotland, 
in England mm -hmm. uh, over 25 years ago. And uh, sure. by the way, my father was a firearms instructor for law enforcement. I grew up in a house full of guns. We went skeet shooting mm -hmm. uh, every weekend. Um, and after that event, handguns were banned in the United Kingdom. And uh, semi-automatic weapons had already been prohibited after the Hungerford massacre in the 80s. Um, there's not been a school shooting, period. A gun has not gone off in, in a UK school in over 25 years. Um, and if you look at the rates of gun violence between the UK and the US, you know, the, the United States has about 100 times as many gun deaths as the, as the UK. So th it's very clear that it's there. But I agree with you that those confiscation efforts are, are not going to, they're not viable in the United States. It's not going to happen. There's 400 million guns. There's a Second Amendment right to bear arms. That's not a viable solution. But there's still things you can do to take firearms out of the equation for those who are on that pathway to violence. And I think it, everybody can agree on that. Sure, sure. I mean, um, as far as, you know, the people who are showing significant issues, of course, you know, in the United States, um, we view gun rights as natural rights, as human rights, as, as something protected by, in the same way we would protect freedom of speech. And I think this is my main critique of some of the proposals in the book is that they, uh, and not just the gun proposals, but also there were, you know, you talk about um, essentially finding um, social media platforms that host, uh, I guess, content that is potentially encouraging mass shooters or, or uh, and that's another issue where like uh, you, you see these same sort of speech restrictions in countries where you have a lot of gun restrictions as well. And it's I think culturally here in the United States, we view um, a lot of people, not and not everybody agrees, obviously, but, sure. um, you know, these as significant civil liberties restrictions, uh, which is one of the main issues that you run up against with even things like red flag laws, um, where, you know, uh, I think a lot of people can agree in theory that these are uh, make sense. But but in practice, uh, there's concerns about the lack of due process protections. Uh, it seems like something that perhaps can be overcome. We've done podcasts on this as well with uh, David French, for instance, who's an advocate for red flag laws and don't have to get into a whole long discussion about it. But it, I think my main critique was that there, you know, in the book, there's a lot of concern about uh, criminalizing mental health or people with mental illnesses, right? And, and the, the effects of that or the effects of uh, over criminalizing schools by having school resource officers there and, and, you know, balancing this against uh, you guys lay out, I think, uh, legitimate critiques of why some of these school security measures or active shooter drills are uh, have flaws and are certainly far from perfect and not going to prevent every shooting. And have there have been shootings at locations that have these things. Um, but uh, at the same time, there's not really the same concern for over criminalizing gun owners, for instance, you know, through broad um restrictions on I firearms book, i don't think the book talks about criminalizing law-abiding gun owners it's just it's no, about distinguishing well, I mean, when everyone's a good guy with a gun mm -hmm. until they're not right sure but, so but when, I, when my point is line? like right yeah no I, that's a fair question but but obviously the anyway, policies uh where you draw the line well, i mean obviously when, when in, everybody you, who's perpetrated mass shooting who mm -hmm. purchased a firearm legally right yeah was a good right. guy until they pulled the mm -hmm. trigger. So sure. at which point do you draw the line with, well, these are bad guys with guns and these are good guys with guns? Mm -hmm. So there has to be reasonable well, restrictions around firearms, right? You wouldn't want right. a six-year-old owning well, an AR-15, would you? Uh, certainly not. No, exactly. So, so we can agree <laughs> that there are reasonable restrictions yes. for firearms. That's not infringing on anyone's civil liberties. That's just common sense. Well, uh, I mean, I, I understand that certainly there, and we have a significant number of regulations around firearms in the United States. Correct. For instance, the thing that differentiates people from a good guy or a bad guy in our uh, law is, of course, if you've committed, you've been convicted of crimes or you've been involuntarily committed, that's where, uh, you know, you generally want a high bar when you view something as a, uh, and as I, a right. And I 100% agree with you. What I'm asking you is like, this is, is the problem that with broad, bar enough? Uh, like confiscation. Do you think that bar's enough? 
do I do you personally think it's think, working? Um, I mean, I don't think that uh, it is well enforced in a lot of cases. I don't know that there uh, are enough ways for people to um, get the help that's required for for somebody going through a crisis like you've discussed in, in at length here in the podcast and in the book. Um, and, and so, no, as far as like, obviously, the society has an issue with uh, preventing uh, gun violence generally and um, mass shootings in particular. I just think that they're obviously, as I think we agree here, that it's very difficult to do. And something like broad-based bans are, uh, my point with the overcriminalization critique is that, you know, certainly people with mental health Ill, Ill, uh, issues perpetrate mass shootings, not the majority of them. No. Uh, and you don't want to overcriminalize somebody because, well, some mass shooters have psychotic episodes or, and you don't want to overcriminalize everyone. You don't want to assume that everybody who's had a traumatic childhood, for instance, is going to be a mass shooter. You don't want to look at people as though they are potential mass shooters. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, so there's concern about this in the book, um, which I think is justified and legitimate. You know, you don't want to go back to the old asylum system, right? Where no, locked <laughs> no, up we all certainly the don't. People with mental health issues. But, but um, I guess, um, I guess, um, what I want to ask is, which of the solutions around firearms? Mm -hmm. So take something like universal background checks, safe storage, mm -hmm. um, preventing someone uh, over the age of 21 from purchasing uh, an AR-15 style weapon. Um, which, which of those types of solutions or, or red flag laws, I know red flag laws are controversial, but if they're, well, if they're well enforced and there's proper due process, right? Yeah. Um, that it's not just arbitrarily determined that there's a judge and there's oversight and other things, right? If those things are in place, they're not that controversial, are they? I think the vast majority of law-abiding gun owners are on board with that stuff. And there's nothing in the book about we're just going to shred the Second Amendment and start over. Like it's, no. it's, it's what are the common sense measures that are out there that even law-abiding gun owners are, are on board with? And I think most of those aren't that controversial, really. The only one I, I would say is more controversial is around our relationship with so-called assault weapons, right? And then we talk about in the book that there's a lot of differing definitions about what they even are. And, and I mean, yeah. you're the expert, you know, you know that better sure. than anybody. But I would say beyond that, I can see why that's a thorny issue and, and people yeah. get, get pretty passionate about that. But beyond that, you know, um, don't we want measures in place to prevent potentially violent and dangerous people from getting access to firearms? We're all on board for that, right? Yeah, uh, but that's where broad-based solutions become an issue, where you're you're talking about banning magazines or certain kinds of firearms for everyone instead of people who have demonstrated that they are a threat to themselves or others. That That's, I guess, where if you're talking about drawing the line, uh, you get a lot of gun owners and gun rights advocates who uh, will fall on the other side of the line from where from where you are, right? And and you know that that's where, um, you know, th things like banning AR-15s, for instance. You know, in in the book, I, you know, certainly it, there's a perfectly legitimate point to be made about how frequently these show up in mass shootings compared to how often they're used in other sorts of crimes because it is more prevalent. Yeah. But uh, you know, if you're someone who owns an AR-15, as I do. Um, or is a gun rights advocate. And, you know, the argument is, well, we should ban these guns because they're used in mass shootings, right? Um, uh, as your research shows pretty clearly, yeah. uh, handguns are more commonly used in mass shootings. And they're also much more commonly used in everyday gun crimes. And so the, the concern becomes, well, if I say yes to that, why, why, would I, why would it stop there? Why wouldn't it just be all handguns and then Eventually, you get to a point where, you know, you, you can't own firearms like is the case in many of the countries that you point to as uh, potential templates for the United States. That's that's where the that's where I think the big sticking point comes in these conversations. No, I think I think that's a I think that's a fair point, um, which is, you know, there is that kind of the fear of the slippery slope, right, of mm -hmm. right. you start chipping away here and it, and it becomes this cascade effect. And so. Again, what we're trying to go back to is what do the data show us that can be preventative yeah. for mass shootings? 
Um, there's certainly going to be some of the things that the data support that maybe uh, the American public won't, right? Yeah. Um, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that they're wrong. It just means that they're not palatable. They're not, they're not feasible. Yeah. Um, there's different there's different uh, cultural trade-offs or different exactly. values that that uh, you know obviously another big part of the book is discussing sort of the downsides of American rugged individualism compared exactly. to sort of European uh, more collective view of, of the world or, or what have you and obviously there but there there's are upsides other to that too there's right a, I mean right. that is why America is a great country of entrepreneurism because right. of, because of so there's an upside to it too but here's the key thing yeah. right. Here's what ends up happening. We fixate on the one thing we don't like. Yeah, yeah. So we say, I don't like the AR-15 ban, or I don't like magazine restrictions. I should be able to have right. as many uh, bullets in my, in my gun as I want, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're not going to have this conversation anymore. We're going to shut down and do nothing, right? Right. We've been doing nothing for generations. So let's find the common ground where we can agree. You know what? Maybe we can make some steps in the right in the right direction here right mm -hmm. so maybe the standard for you have to have had a felony conviction or you have to have been adjudicated as mentally deficient and a, and and have, and have placed in a, in a in an asylum which is effectively what how it was written back in 1968 right mm -hmm. maybe we can revisit that and say are there other ways that we could potentially prevent somebody who's on the pathway to violence from getting access to a firearm and slowing down that process as well. Because here's the other thing we write about a lot in the book, which you know, is there's often a case where these are individuals who've never owned a firearm before. And that's a different audience to the people who listen to this podcast, right? And that these are people, the people who listen to this podcast are law abiding gun owners, right? Who in many cases probably have a lot of guns and we're not worried about them, right? These are individuals who've never owned a gun before, have never expressed an interest in a gun before, never done it. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of a personal crisis, right. where Coupled they're studying other, Columbine that, yeah. on the internet, mm -hmm. right. where they're leaking plans to perpetrate a shooting, where they're posting on social media that they want to murder their classmates, that then they walk into the gun store and say, one AR-15, please. And we turn around and say, well, they haven't had a felony conviction and they've not been adjudicated in a court. So there's nothing I can do to stop that. I can't even delay that for longer than 72 hours. I, I mean, I think there's something there where we could all get on, on board for that. that. That's really the key here is let's not let some of the details break us down so we do nothing. Let's get to a point where we can say, you know what, we probably could make a few tweaks and changes here that could save lives. And I think that's the real key thing here. So just about slowing down that process. If we know the pathway to violence is long, as we've talked about, right? If you're on the pathway, how do you get that person diverted so they are not then purchasing a firearm? That's the key. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think... Um... One of the issues when you're talking about gun reform aspect of it is there's just so little trust between each side that, uh, as uh, you know, as we've been discussing here, and so maybe the be the best path is to start with some of the other solutions that you talked with, and and um, you know, if perhaps that can rebuild some of the trust and good faith engagement on the issue um, in, in that way, if you know people can agree on some of the other aspects and make an actual real concerted effort to. Uh, implement some of those things that we spent the majority of this podcast talking about, um, where there's less likely to be those sort of um, very serious, uh, you know, ideological, culturally, it was strongly held beliefs. And clashing. Stephen, that's the key, right? Is you want, yeah. you know, you want people to have good, honest, open dialogue. You want mm. to build trust. And, you know, there's the old adage that you always hear, you know, you want to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Let's do it. Like, let's, let's, you know, and I think in some ways, like the bar, the bipartisan uh, safety bill that was passed last year is yeah. a little bit of an example of that, right? It's not perfect. People disagreed. People don't like some aspects of it, but they like other aspects of it. 
But it mm -hmm. tried to embrace the complexity of these issues, which is to say that we can fund mental health in schools. We can put money into safety and security. We can also address some of the gaps in our firearms policy around gun safety. We can do all of this at the same time. There is common ground to work from. And mm -hmm. the thing that just is so frustrating about this is that it feels so hopeless otherwise, because you just get entrenched in yeah. there's nothing we can do. But right. there's tons we can do. Um, and, and, I, and I think everybody needs to be thinking about, you know what? I'm part of the solution here. We all are. So let's, let's do it. Let's all be part of it. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, look, uh, you've given us more time than, than we agreed to. So I really appreciate you <laughs> sticking around. It was a great conversation. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I, I thought it went really well. And I appreciate you sticking around even to just, uh, address some of the critiques. Cause I'm sure that's not the fun part of doing these interviews, but, uh, but I do uh, really uh, have a lot of respect for the work that you that you guys are doing with this project. And I do think that there is a lot more to agree about here than disagree about. And um, and I do see, you know, actual not just an acknowledgement of the complexity of the issue, but also realistic solutions to it. Um, you know, the perhaps not light switch solutions where it's just we need this one simple trick to fix everything that's not that's not realistic. Yeah. It's not how things actually work in practice, but, uh, but solutions that are still practical to, for people to implement both at the individual level and at the societal level. So I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and talking about that with us. No, it's been great. Like I say, the, these are tough conversations, but we got to have them. So uh, yeah. this has been fun. I've, I've really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I, I hope the listeners enjoyed it too. Good. Um, and where can people find you if they want to read more of your work? So we're at theviolenceproject.org. Um, as was mentioned, we've got a key findings page. You can download the full database. And there's also a link to, uh, to access the book. Uh, you can buy the book, uh, The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. So theviolenceproject.org is how you can get in touch with us. It's also an audible because that's, that's how it I It is. It is. To you, it. you can get a CD. You can get a Kindle edition. You can get a, the, uh, the, the audible edition. You can get paperback, hardback. It's all there. So, yeah. Wonderful. All right. Well, we appreciate you coming on. We're going to head over to our news update segment now. Thank you. All right. Hey there, Jake. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right, Stephen. How are you? I'm doing all, I'm doing pretty well, you know, all things considered. I'm about to fly out to uh, Indianapolis for the NRA annual meeting. So that'll be interesting. That's, that's the same city for anyone who's paying close attention that they had the NRA annual meeting in Back uh, in 2019, when the big blow up happened, the big fight where you saw Oliver North leave early and there was the whole uh, mess at the members meeting. And um, yeah, that, so it's interesting that they're going back there because it sort of invites comparisons, I think, to the, the four years ago. And uh, the NRA has shrunk quite a lot in that time as we've covered you know quite a lot here at the reload and uh, you can i mean some of the things are fairly obvious just up front which is uh, in 2019 they had you know donald trump who was president then speaking they have him again this time uh, and they had a collection of other well-known republicans ted cruz i believe was one and uh, the governor of the state and they still have that this time around, although I believe two of the biggest names in Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley are not actually going to physically be there to speak. They're sending video messages, which is, I think, never a great sign. Um, apparently, they had better things to do. Yeah. Uh, and of course, in 2019, the those speeches were held at Lucas Oil Field, where the Indianapolis Colts play. It's actually the only time I've ever been on an NFL, NFL field, like the actual field area. It was a pretty cool experience. But they filled out – now, it was only half the stadium. They had this, this, the stage at half field, you know, the 50-yard line. and then, But they filled up, like, at least the lower level of the rest of that stadium, big, giant venue. This year, they're not doing that. This year, it's in one of the conference uh, – auditoriums so probably much more similar to the interannual meeting last year where donald trump also spoke in what was 
I don't know. It's kind of the size of like a small college's gym um, in terms of seating capacity. So we'll have to see what this one looks like, but I can basically guarantee it will be smaller than the one four year previous. So anyway, I'll be out there covering it and seeing what goes on. I say it should be interesting, obviously, because Donald Trump is vying to try to come back into politics. And as you said, some other prominent names are uh, maybe not going to be there in person, but are also participating at least. So the dynamic should be interesting to follow. Yeah, they still were able to get every major Republican who's uh, going to be running for the primary to at least send a video message to the event. Uh, and obviously they have Donald Trump himself, who is the front runner um, and most controversial figure in Republican politics or politics generally, I guess, um, speaking as the headliner. So um, we'll see, we'll see what, how, what kind of crowds they draw. I mean, last year was a little bit hard to compare. It was the smallest one since, since 2006, but it was also the first one since the COVID-19 outbreak happened because they canceled two consecutive annual meetings for that. And, um, it was also shortly after the Uvalde shooting in, and it was in Texas. So there were a number of reasons why people might not have gone to that one. Uh, it was still, COVID was still a larger concern than it is today. Um, you know, obviously uh, there've been, you know, the, the virus is not a, as top of mind as it was even just a year ago for most people. So, uh, Perhaps they'll have a rebound in attendance this year. We'll see. You know, obviously they've had a huge slide in membership, so that's working against them. But, but I'll be there and I'll report on anything that happens. I wouldn't expect too much action on the governance side of the NRA. You know, they're really the last two uh, really dissident board members are going to be done their terms at this annual meeting. So Phil Journey and Frank Tate are both going to be off the board. They were not renominated shockingly, by the nominating committee of the board that really kind of controls access to the ballot uh, for NRA members. So there really isn't anyone left who's internally going to be advocating for significant change to leadership or function of the NRA. So I wouldn't expect too many fireworks like you saw four years ago. Uh, but perhaps the members meeting will generate some interest. Uh, it didn't last year. I mean, only 500 people voted at the members meeting for or the annual meeting for the uh, 76 board member last year, which is a pretty bad showing for a group with 4 million plus members. Uh, but anyway, that's not our main focus of the segment today. We are instead talking about a new ruling by uh, a federal judge against uh, or at least tossing charges against um, some drug users over their uh, ownership of firearms. And this is a pretty interesting case. deals with the federal prohibition on, I guess, habitual drug users owning firearms. Um, can you, you wrote about this, Jake, so you, you know the details here. Tell us what happened. Yeah, so it's sort of just the latest in a, a string of cases that we've seen calling into question many of the prohibiting offenses listed under the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968. Uh, so in this case, as you said, it was a, a federal, it was a criminal case that was being reheard now in light of Bruin, where a Texas woman, a West Texas woman was arrested because when police were called to her home to investigate a separate domestic abuse, uh, domestic disturbance, they found a bunch of marijuana, some psilocybin mushrooms, as well as multiple firearms and ammunition. Um, and she had, this woman admitted to police that she was a habitual user of marijuana, which under current federal law is illegal. It's technically a prohibiting offense. It asks you specifically about that on the background check. Yes. Um, and she admitted to owning the firearm as well. So she was charged uh, with being an unlawful user of an illegal substance while possessing a firearm. Uh, but this judge said, one, tossed the charges and said that that was actually unconstitutional, that provision right mm. there because it doesn't comport with our nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation, which is the Bruin standard. Right. And the, the, I guess the main reason that it, that the judge found it wasn't uh, in line with historical tradition of firearms regulation is because it's a total prohibition on gun ownership for life. Right. Yeah, that's right. So there are some 
the the state or the federal government, for example, cited a few colonial era laws, one in Virginia, one in New York, that were about alcohol use and firearms, but it was mostly you can't the crux of it was basically you can't shoot your guns while you're drunk, right? You can't be drinking and, and fire off your guns. And this judge said, well, you know, that's a little more narrow than this, <laughs> this ban that completely bans you for life if you occasionally consume a substance that uh, in many states is, is legal now. Um, she she yeah. made a, an analogy that it would be like for our current DUI regulations, if we completely banned car ownership for folks that occasionally drink alcohol on the weekends was sort of how she related that. Right. Um, it's interesting because this, so this is another criminal case, right? Where we're yeah. seeing the effects of Bruin because it's certainly not what I would call a great test case. It's not the kind of case that if you're, uh, you know, a gun rights activist who wants to um, overturn the marijuana prohibition, you probably wouldn't choose this case because it wasn't just marijuana involved. I think the husband was also a, addicted to crack cocaine. And, and I believe they were uh, also um, accused of threatening people with, with firearms as well. So, you know, not your sort of model plaintiffs, I guess. Um, but this is another instance where you've seen sort of these wild card appearances of of Bruin and lower courts because they're not, you know, these aren't planned cases like you would have from the Second Amendment Foundation or the NRA or or the, uh, you know, Firearms Policy Coalition or GOA or whoever. Uh, instead, these are criminal um, proceedings. I don't do you know if the lawyer was a public defender in this case? I don't recall off the top of my head, but what is interesting mm. is what prompted this sort of revisiting of, of these charges was the mm. Rahimi case, which is what we've covered previously, was the ruling right. that struck down the, the ban on uh, gun ownership by folks that have domestic violence restraining orders on their record. Because yeah. that ruling was handed down, it opened a door in this proceeding to uh, revisit these charges. Because I guess this, point, this uh, defendant had previously tried to get these charges dismissed and the courts weren't having it. But then once Rahimi came down, they were able to then go back, revisit it under the Bruin test. And this was the result. Mm. So I think that's interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. So you're seeing the effect of that precedent in the Fifth Circuit already. Now, of course, <clears throat> the Department of Justice has appealed Rahimi to the Supreme Court. And that might actually be the next Second Amendment case that the court hears because there's a sort of preferential treatment given to the government, uh, the federal government in uh in appeals to the Supreme Court, because then, you know, generally that you don't want to have a federal law enforced differently throughout the country. And so uh, we might we might well see Rahimi as the next big gun case in the Supreme Court. And it'll be really interesting to see where the, the court actually comes down on that, um, because it's not, you know, it's certainly not one of these. Uh, we've talked about before how the court has been behind public opinion on gun policy in a lot of the, their, their main cases to this point. You know, Heller was 2008 and said you can't totally ban handguns. And that was well after the public had already you know, turned against handgun bans, um, you know, well after that happened. And same thing for Bruin, which was about gun carry. You can't, you basically can't, uh, whether completely or effectively, uh, eliminate the ability for most people to legally carry a firearm. Um, and that too was well after there was a long-term societal shift on that question from, you know, the, the 1970s where 1970s and 80s, where you basically couldn't carry concealed anywhere in the country or the vast majority of the country to, you know, right before Bruin happened where, almost half the country was permitless carry and most of the rest was shall issue. Meaning you know, if you could pass the background check and do the required training, you, the government had to give you a permit. And so there are only eight States left with the, the may issue policy that got struck down and, and ruined. So it'll be interesting to see where the court comes down when it's not such a popular position to, to get rid of a certain regulation because I, you know, domestic violence restraining orders, while, uh, you know, the Fifth Circuit talked about some of the legitimate concerns 
involved with associating those those orders with a hang with a, you know a ban on gun ownership. Um, I would imagine those are fair, much more popular uh, positions generally in the American public. Now, obviously, that's not supposed to matter as a you know a factor in deciding case, but <clears throat> I think it would be maybe a little bit naive to think that it doesn't matter at all in how the the court looks at these things. So yeah. we'll have to see. And same with this one, right? I think you. Yeah. There's probably a lot of a lot more support for removing marijuana from the sort of substance that makes you prohibited person uh, who can't own guns. While you know, if you smoke weed, um, but you know, the rest of those restrictions, I don't know that there's nearly as much support there, right? I was going to say that's it's a funny phenomenon that's happening where these criminal cases are coming up with all this new Second Amendment jurisprudence because defense lawyers mm -hmm. are using the Bruin test basically to get a lot of their clients off. And as you said, it's hard to see public opinion uh, being so closely aligned with the outcome of these cases as it may, maybe is on under Heller and Bruin, like you said, because not only do you have yeah. you know a crack cocaine user getting off <laughs> under this test, you have domestic violence restraining order. Uh, people under domestic violence restraining orders being allowed to own guns. There was a felony indictment. Uh, the, the ban on gun ownership by folks under felony indictment was struck down in a separate case as well. Right. So you're just seeing a series of these criminal cases where it's hard to imagine public opinion being aligned with the outcomes. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's where you're going to see, I think, a real test of the court's um, willingness to stick closely to uh, history and tradition, or at least uh, we'll see how they, what they interpret the tradition of being, um, and and how sort of how loose an analogy can be before it becomes, um, you know, too far out to justify a restriction. So uh, I think it'll be interesting to watch the court handle that question. Um, and Rahimi itself was a that was a criminal case as well. It's kind of a weird one too because. He's charged with so many other crimes that are very likely to make him a prohibited person anyway, that it's a bit strange to see this case uh, even be filed <laughs> or like challenge this particular restriction because he's facing like five different felony charges for serious crimes. Um, and once those are completed, he's not going to be able to own guns anyway, but. I don't know. We'll see. We're certainly going to see how it all plays out. Uh, you know, I think this is a win, certainly for those who want to see marijuana removed from that uh, list of pro things that make you a prohibited person using weed. You know, there's certainly I think there's plenty of uh, people and it's probably a growing constituency who don't really see a significant difference between weed usage and alcohol usage. And um, and, you know, there's obviously plenty of states where it's decriminalized at least at the state level to use marijuana recreationally. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly there's probably plenty of people in those States who don't think they should be banned from owning guns for life because they use marijuana recreationally. But, but again, you know, this, this, this case goes beyond that to harder drugs as well. So we'll, we'll have to see where it all comes down. Um, uh, once this case moves further along, or, or at least once the Supreme Court takes up Rahimi, if, if they do, I mean, I guess it's not a guarantee that they will. It's just extremely likely. So we will we will stay on top of that, though. Uh, Jake here will certainly be following it, right? That's right. And, uh, you know, so if you want to keep up with that and everything else going on with Guns in America, you should head over to thereload.com, sign up for our free weekly newsletter, or buy a membership to get exclusive access to Hundreds of pieces of reporting and analysis on guns that you will not find anywhere else out there. Uh, and also to support our reportings. We are a member-funded publication. So all of our money comes from you guys, the members. And so, you know, that's one great way to support us. If you don't have the means or uh, desire to do that at this moment, you can also support us by reviewing this podcast on your favorite app, wherever you're listening to this. Uh, also liking it on YouTube, sharing it with your friends, leaving comments, all those sort of things that make the algorithms enjoy sharing our content. <laughs> um, but until next time, uh, you know, we'll see you guys. 